me of a story I heard there was a professor from uh, supposedly a very learned man, obviously, at the uh, University of Notre Dame that retired. And his, his speech was, he says, there's two things I've learned from life. One is there is a God, the second is I'm not him. And that was the whole speech. <laughs> I guess that's good advice, huh? There's a God that's not us. Um, John chapter 15. Let me see if we can try to here. John chapter 15. And uh, I, I started this last uh, Sunday morning, if you remember, right? And I spoke on John 15, and we looked at uh, primarily verse 1. And uh, kind of worked our way through it a little bit. But what I'm doing is just, today I want to picture on last week I, I talked about the branches that didn't bear fruit and today I want to talk about the branches that do bear fruit and uh, hopefully as we dig into this a little bit today and study this a little bit today it will help us understand how God bears fruit in our life and understand the process of how God bears fruit in our life and maybe by looking at that we're going to get some understanding of maybe some areas in our life where we haven't seen fruit and why that might be uh, but John chapter 15 is a, a parable that Jesus taught, and in there he used the example that he's the vine and we're the branches. And then the heavenly father then is the gardener, or the husbandman who takes care of the garden. And uh, you know, and then he breaks down the, the example of some branches are bearing fruit and some branches aren't bearing fruit. And last week I looked at the fact that you know some branches you know, were on the vine, but yet they didn't bear fruit. In other words, there were some branches that died on the vine, and they were not receiving their nutrients that normally you should. Uh, today, I want to look at John chapter 15. Look at verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. That's what we talked about last Sunday. Uh, this Sunday, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So today, we're going to look at the positive side of it. The branches that bear fruit and the fact that God the Father purges them or prunes them so that they might bear more fruit. And uh, a lot of people take that, that word there, purge or prune, and, and kind of, you know, come up with all kinds of ideas about, you know, all these terrible things out here that happen to me, that's God trying to prune me. And that's not the case in the Word of God. Uh, I'm going to look at it a little bit differently today. The primary way that God prunes us, the primary way that God purges us or refines us is through the Word of God. And uh, that's one of the main functions of the Bible. One of the main functions of the Word of God is to, to, is to prepare the branches to bear fruit, uh, to equip the branches to bear fruit. The same way that a natural branch needs nutrition to bear fruit, we as spiritual branches, so to speak, need nutrition to bear fruit. And one of the primary needs of nutrition is the Word of God. But the Word of God also prunes us a little bit. The Word of God also prepares us and equips us to bear more fruit and to, to, and, uh, to do better at that, so to speak. So that's kind of what the avenue I'm going to look at today is, is first of all, how does the Father prune us? How does the Father purge us? How does the Father prepare us to be more fruitful in our lives? Uh, I'm going to just kind of jump off real quickly at Psalm 119, if you want to follow along with me. I'm going to walk you through several scriptures this morning and just kind of give you an idea of how the Word of God will prune us, how the Word of God will purge us. Psalm 119, verse 9 Psalm 119, verse 9. And I will read that to you. Psalm 119, verse 9. I guess I'd have to turn to it first. <laughs> Psalm 119, verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. So one of the ways that the word of God will prune us or purge us is it will cleanse our way. It will cleanse our path. It will cleanse our life into so that if it's talked about here, if, they, if we heed the Word of God. Now, first of all, we have to heed the Word of God, doesn't it? And that's what it very plainly says. If we heed the Word of God, then we will cleanse our way. And to heed the Word of God, again, is a word that means basically attend to it, observe it, or regard it. I like to make a, a simple definition of that, or a simple explanation that that's when you face something in life, the first question that should come to your mind as a believer is, what does God
God's Word say about this? That should be the very first part of our thought process. Anytime we're looking at something, even anytime we're seeking understanding of something, the very first question we should ask ourselves is, what does God's Word say about this? I've got this problem in life. I've got this situation I'm facing in life. What does God's Word say about it? I've got to make a decision in life. I, I, I've got a crossroads. I've got to either go to the left. I've got to go to the right. What does God's Word say about that situation? That should be your number one question and your number one thing. Because if you're going to be fruit-bearing and we're looking at how the Word of God will equip us or prune us to better bear fruit, one of the, the key areas there is that simple thing. What does God's Word say about it? And I'm going to walk in the way that God's Word defines to me. I'm going to walk in the way that God's Word describes to me. I'm going to heed God's Word. And uh, I, I just that this last week, and I, I want to not go into a whole lot of details, but I, I don't discuss things with people on Facebook very rarely. And I very rarely will enter anything on Facebook. But I will click it on, and I'll look and see, and I'll, you know, watch it sometimes, see what people are saying. And I found it kind of, I don't know what the right word is, it, it, kind, of, it kind of broke my heart this last week, as I, as I watched a lot of different people discuss things on Facebook. I mean, there's a lot of really tragic, serious things taking place in our nation. And there's a lot of very serious situations in our nation. And I watched a lot of people discussing this on Facebook. And what disturbed me was this, was a lot of the people I know that were on there were people that I know who are believers. And what bothered me was all of their opinions had nothing to do with the Word of God. I mean, all of their opinions and their discussions was no different than the opinions and the discussions of the world. Because why? They had not asked them themselves this simple question. What does God's word say about it? You see, beloved, we as believers are very quick to give our opinions. And you've heard me say this to probably some of you. Uh, uh, my opinion's not worth anything. It's really not. What we need to know is what does God's word say about it? You know, and we're really in a time when we're facing a lot of very serious situations in this nation. I mean, we just went to a, uh, uh, another school shooting where 17 high school kids were killed, and everybody in the world has an opinion about what needs to be done to stop that. But I didn't hear one person quote anything from the Word of God. And we have got all kinds of situations out here in Italy locally where people are dying from drug addictions and drug overdoses, and, and everybody has an opinion, but what does the Word of God say about addiction? You see, these are the kind of things we need to ask ourselves. Because we as God's children, we as God's church, beloved, we need to be the light in the darkness, don't we? And if we're not telling the world what the Word says, then we're not the light. Our opinion is not a light. We are to stand here and we're to proclaim to the world what the answer and the solution is to the situations, not just give our political opinions. Hallelujah. Amen. You've got to shout with me before we get to this. Hallelujah. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> like I said, sometimes when I get in some of these teachings, be careful how you hallelujah. You see, there are certain basic things that we need to understand about the Word of God if we're going to understand how to present the solution to people. Amen? Amen? You see, the Bible teaches us something that is exactly one of the things I see that I was watching as I was listening to, not listening to whatever you do on Facebook, you, you don't listen to that, you watch, I guess. And read, I guess, would be the proper way to say Reading what people were saying about it's all these different situations is, you know, one of the basic things I understand as, I, as I'm reading these things is obviously these all people all had a worldly point of view of mankind. And they had a, a worldly point of view of the problem. Because if you don't understand how the Bible describes man, then you're obviously not going to understand the problem. You see, the world will tell you that man comes into this world and man is in great shape. Psychology will tell you that we come into this world and we're in great shape and bad things happen to us. And when bad things happen to people, then that gets bad results and their behavior is bad. The world will tell you that, 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 that because of evolution, everything in man is getting better. The Bible will tell you the exact opposite to that. The Bible says that mankind comes into this world as a falling being with problems and a nature that is wrong. You see, the world tells us that, that, that mankind is just, you know, is great, he's good, he comes into this world, if he was raised right, if he had the right environment, if 
we had the when we had the right president, we had the right political structure, if we had the right social structure, everything would be fine and none of these things would ever happen. The Bible says that mankind comes into this world with a fallen nature as a result of what happened in the Garden of Eden. Man, when man turned away from God and, man, and then man spiritually died or was separated from God, man's nature became a corrupt. The Bible says there's something wrong with the heart of man and out of the heart of man comes all of these problems. The Bible would tell us that out of the heart of man comes school shootings. The Bible would tell us out of the heart of fallen man comes drug addiction. The Bible would tell us out of the fallen heart of man come, comes robbery. And on and on and on and on. I didn't make that up. Jesus said that. You see, in Mark chapter 7, it teaches us that there was a time, and you've heard me talk about this before, where the Pharisees and them, they had this big old religious procedure they would go through to wash their hands to prove that they were they clean enough to eat and, and it would became a big ceremony. And Jesus' disciples didn't do that and they ate. And the Pharisees came to them and, and, and Jesus said, Jesus, why do your disciples not go through the ceremonial cleansing? And he says, don't you understand something? You see, it's out of the heart of man he went on and he ran off this list of murders and adulteries and, and hatred and all the different things that comes from the heart of man. He says it's what comes from within man that defiles him, now what goes into man that defiles him. Now that may seem like a small point, but that is the exact opposite of what the world says. The world says what comes outside of here does something to us. The Bible says what's inside of us comes out into the world. I like to use the example. It just take a little, you know, imagination here to imagine the planet Earth without people on it. How many murders would there be? How many robberies would there be? In other words, if we weren't on this planet, this planet would be fine. Because we're the problem. As I always say, man doesn't have problems, man is the problem. You see, this may seem very basic to you and very simple to you, but it's something that Christians have to understand to the point that it enters into their thought process. Because if we fall in line with what the world says, then we only answer, offer the world's answers. If we say, well, man comes into this world and he's fine and, and you know, these bad things happen and it's just a psychological matter, then we need to send him to a psychologist. If it's just a, a matter that man is fine and it's just our environment, then we just need, the government needs to take control of the homes and make sure everybody's raised right. If it's just a, a matter of, of man's you know, political situation, we just need to vote new people in office. I'm 63 years old and it's I. Every president we've ever had in office, we've had the same problems. I've lived through a few of them now. <laughs> and you know what? There has never been a president in office that murder didn't happen while he was there. There's never been a president in office that, that every hideous thing you can think of that happens today didn't happen in his, his time. It's not a political problem. It's not a psychological problem. It's not an economic problem. It's not a social problem. It is a fallen sin nature man problem. Hallelujah. Everybody says, that's good shot. <laughs> you see, I'm going to challenge the body of Christ a little bit this morning before I'm going to teach you. Do you remember the parable of the Good Samaritan? Good Samaritan remember the, the, the gentleman was robbed? They had crime back then! In Jesus' time. He was robbed! And who was it? The Levite walked right past him, didn't he? Didn't pay any attention to him. Pharisee walked right past him, didn't he? Didn't pay any attention to him. And then the one that we refer to as the Good Samaritan. He went and he ministered to the wounded that was laying on the side of the road. He bandaged him up. He cared for his wounds. He took him to an end and said, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to pay the bill. Whatever he needs, you take care of him. You notice what he didn't do. He didn't go hunt for the robbers. He didn't start a political movement to get 
more laws to stop crime. You see, he had one concern. And his concern was the wounded on the side of the road. And out of all the stuff I read on Facebook, I didn't find anybody that expressed any concern about the wounded victims who were left behind with the tragedies that had taken place. All I seen was a bunch of Christians with their telling their political agendas and what should be done and shouldn't be done and what laws should be passed and what laws shouldn't be passed. Beloved, our job as Christians is to stay as a minister to the wounded who are left on the side of the road. Our job is to offer to a lost and dying world Jesus Christ who is the solution and who is the answer. What is needed in this nation is not more laws. It's a move of the Holy Ghost. It's a church that will rise up and proclaim Christ and Him crucified. It's godly people who will go and minister to the wounded on the side of the road. That's the what we need to rise up and do. But first we might need to have the word purge us a little bit. And refine us a little bit. And the church has to realize what the problem is. Can I give you a newsflash? President Trump ain't the problem. Mankind is the problem. What's inside a man? You see, in the, in the days before God judged the world in, in, in the time of Noah. There were a couple things that he brought out to our attention. The imagination of man was evil continually. The problem was man's imagination. The problem was inside a man. And right before he judged it, and this is something that the body of Christ, Christians need to wake up to. Right before he judged it. Right before he judged it. He said that the world was filled with violence. He, now, let me, let me explain something to you. Did you notice the connection there? The, the imagination of man was evil continually. And the world was filled with violence. The heart of man is violent. And is a bloodthirsty spirit roaming our streets, taking advantage of it. You think, Richard, where are you going with all this? Oh, you'll see it in just a moment. Hopefully, hopefully I will get there. You see, something happened when man fell. Two of the key things that we've got to understand that man's nature became corrupt. And I'm not going to all the scriptures. I mean, you know, the bulk of the Bible describes that. But it also, we, we were given authority in the garden, weren't we? God gave us authority to watch over the garden and take care of it. And then when we, when mankind bowed his knee to Satan, he initially basically handed that authority to Satan. You see, beloved, when we bow our knees to the ways of the enemy, we throw doors wide open to the enemy. And so we have fallen men in our society who have allowed that to run wild. We've, allowed, we've had a church who has abandoned the truth of God's word and now offers the world solutions and doors have been thrown wide open to every demon in hell and we sit and we look at a society that is murdering itself, a society that is destroying itself with drugs and alcohol, a society that is in bondage to every possible sin you can imagine and we're trying to give worldly answers to it. There are no worldly answers. The problem is the heart of man. And demons running wild. I hate to break your heart, but we can't put a president in office to fix that. We can't pass laws to fix that. We can't carry enough guns to protect ourselves against that. So, what's this got to do with bear fruit, Pastor? Well, there's a situation in the body to eat the bear some fruit. It's just a practical application of what we're dealing with. You see, the problem is, I sit and I've watched and I've read for a week's time 
Christians, born again people, discussing these things on Facebook, and not one time was the name Jesus ever mentioned. They only offered their political answers and their political solutions. Maybe our thinking has been swayed the wrong direction. Because we understand something by the word of God. We know the problem is man needs to be born again. We know the problem is man needs to stand up and take authority over the demons of hell and close the doors to the enemy. We know that this nation seems to see a move of God. We know this nation needs to build itself upon the word of God. We know that Jesus Christ is the only answer. We know that Jesus Christ is the only solution. We know that Jesus Christ is the only one that can change the heart. And we're debating politics <coughs> in the midst of a society that is devastated and rushing toward the pit of hell at a breath next faith. Maybe we do need to be refined and pruned a little bit by the word of God to get back on track and understand what the answer is in the battle that I speak of. You with me so far? John chapter 17. Ain't God good? Pastor, you're so happy. I can't help it. <laughs> Through thy truth, thy word is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. You drop down to verse 19, and, and Jesus, let me read that to you again, carries on the same line of thought. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified through thy truth. The word sanctified, I've explained that and defined that several times before. It just means set apart for God's purposes. It means set apart for God's work. The illustration I commonly use for that is a sanctuary. It's the same root word where we have a sanctuary. It's, it's a place that's set apart for God's work and God's purposes, for God's glory. In the, in the Old Testament, they had the tabernacle that traveled with them in the wilderness, and, and that was the same word that was a sanctuary. Uh, the Bible even refers to heaven as a sanctuary. A, something that is set apart to be to be used only for God's purposes and that's undefiled. You see, beloved, one of the things we've got to understand, the purposes of God is to sanctify. The purposes of God is to ultimately sanctify all of creation and rid it of sin and the damage thereof. We know as we look into the book of Revelation that in the end times when, when, when and, and, and we see the white throne judgment after the white throne judgment where everybody who's not written down in the, the Lamb's book of life is cast into the lake of fire. That then there's a new heaven and a new earth. Why? Because God is ridding the damage of sin to his creation. And he begins with us. And he begins that work in a believer. And what we're doing now in the life we live is, is, is to be sanctified by the word of God. To be set apart by the word of God. To be pruned and changed by the word of God. And brought to that place. He's dealing with sin in our life. And he's dealing with sin in his creation. And God's ultimate purpose in redemption is to remove all of sin and all the effects of sin from his creation. I used to think, God, I, 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 I know what your word says, and, and I know what it says about hell and the lake of fire, but, but God, that just seems so harsh, but he has to rid of sin. And there's no other way to do it. Sin must be dealt with. Because the wages of sin is death. And sin not dealt with destroys. And if God don't remove sin from his creation, then it, it, it will be destroyed. He must prune the branches. He must get the sin out of the branches. 
Because if the sin in the branches is not dealt with, it will spread to the other branches. And it even spread to the vine. Sin must be dealt with. How do that? Right now, in God's purposes, the Holy Spirit, in this time of grace, is convicting men and women of sin, of righteousness, <coughs> and of judgment. And then we come to Christ, He cleanses us with His blood, He washes our sins away, and He begins that process of sanctifying us with His Word and with His Spirit, and preparing us for eternity. You see, we've got to understand something. If we truly want to be branches that bear fruit, we have to allow God's Word to do its work in our life. We can't just live life how we want to live life, do life how we want to do life. And, 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 and look at life the way the world does. We have to allow the Word of God and the Spirit of God to work in our life. You see, beloved, I talked about last week a little bit, God's purpose in our life is that we be fruitful. When He created mankind, one of the first things He said was be fruitful. And we see after the, the judgment of mankind and the, the flood in the times of Noah, the first thing he told them, be fruitful. So we understand that God's purpose in creating mankind is that we be fruitful. That we live fruitful lives. We're, we're never meant to be created and live barren lives. We're to be fruitful creations. And here in John chapter 15, he, he, he's showing us the details of that over and over and over. Look at verse 16. <laughs> You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. He said he's called us, he's chosen us, he's ordained us. When we were called to Jesus Christ and born again, we were born again with the purpose of bearing fruit. So we have to look at our lives and ask ourselves, am I living that purpose? Am I bearing fruit in my life? And this is not for anybody to, to get heavy up on yourself or be condemning of yourself or, or anything like that, but to understand our purpose is to bear fruit for Jesus. Our purpose is to bear fruit and glorify God. That's what John chapter 15 says, doesn't it? That He is glorified when we bear much fruit. So we can't take these things lightly. We can't be casual about these things and just laugh it off and say, well, yeah, I know I'm supposed to. God doesn't think it's funny. Hallelujah. So let me go back to Genesis chapter 1 for just a moment. Let's go there. Now I want to bring out one key point to you. Genesis chapter 1, verse 29. Verse 28. And God blessed them, and God had said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So he told them, Be fruitful. But you'll notice in the very next verse, he tells them how to be fruitful. He doesn't just leave them hanging. But wouldn't that be all of God said, you be fruitful. And just left you. Well, how am I supposed to do that? But he told them the very next verse, how to be fruitful. Verse 29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for me. Be fruitful, here's a bag of seeds. Now isn't that simple? Be fruitful, here's a bag of seeds. So now all they've got to do is take the seeds, they've got to plant the seeds, they've got to watch over the seed, care for the seed, and that seed in and of itself is going to produce the fruit, isn't it? So God not only told them to be fruitful, He gave them what they needed to be fruitful and told them how to do it. So you're thinking, Pastor, is that what he's talking about in John chapter 15? Is he trying to make all of his farmers? 
world. But he also likewise told us how to bear fruit in the spiritual world. In the natural world, he gave us a bag of seeds. I mean, if, if Paul wants to grow apples, he knows how to grow apples, don't he? What does he need? He needs a seed, doesn't he? If you want to grow tomatoes, and you know how to grow tomatoes, don't you? You, you? you need a seed. But you say, well, how am I supposed to bear fruit spiritually? You need a seed. If you want to be fruitful, you need to understand God's bag of seeds. Mark chapter 4. Let's go. <clears throat> you see, one of the things we've got to understand Jesus, when Jesus taught these things, Jesus wasn't just walking around and, and looking for a good sermon illustration. You know, I, I know preachers that, you know, they've got books and collections and, you know, they've got all kinds of illustrations they've got to fall back on. Stories to tell to illustrate spiritual points. Jesus wasn't, didn't have that book. But what Jesus did have an understanding of, when this universe was created, this universe was created with the purpose of, I can't do it all this, show you all this in the scripture, but when the universe was created, the universe was created with the intent of teaching you and I spiritual truth. So Jesus isn't looking at the, at the, at the farmer and thinking, you know what, that would be a good point. No, way back in the beginning when he created the universe this way, when he created everything this way, he created it because, you know what, well, one day I'm going to use that to do, demonstrate spiritual truth. I'm going to create this physical world in a way that will demonstrate spiritual truth to my people. So when he set up Adam and says, here's the, here's the seed that I'm giving to you to be fruitful, he was doing that because he knows that that's going to demonstrate the spiritual truth to God's people. And then one day in Mark chapter 4, he's trying to teach his principle, and he says, you know what? That farmer out there takes that seed and sows a seed. Now there are certain conditions that seed will grow in. Now there are certain conditions that seed won't grow in. He said, by the way, now after all of these years, let me take a moment and explain to mankind why I created the universe that way. Let me interpret that for you. Mark chapter 4 is what's called the parable of the sower. And you're familiar with that most of you. But he goes and it says the sower soweth. What? Look at verse 14. The sower soweth the word. The Bible tells us that we are born again, not a corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed. What's the incorruptible seed by which we're born again? It's the Word of God, isn't it? You see, what I'm about to share with you right now is probably, as a believer, probably if not the most important thing you can understand, is it's top two or three. Because you know what? We were created to bear fruit. And if we don't understand how to bear fruit, we're not going to bear fruit. Amen? And if we don't understand this parable, Jesus says you can't understand any parable. This is central to understanding the kingdom of God. Look at verse number 15. And in the first part of this, he, he draws a parable, parallel, parallel between the natural and the, and the spiritual. But we're going to go jump right into the spiritual. Verse 15. And these are by, they by the wayside where the word is sown. So the seed is planted. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Now, there's all kinds of people who sit in church all the time and, and, and hear the Word of God all the time, but it never comes to manifestation or never bears fruit in their life. In other words, they've heard it, they hear the preaching, but if you look at their life, it's obviously there's no fruit there. So what is taking place? Well, a lot of times what's taking place, the Word of God, they hear the Word of God, they walk right outside the door, the devil takes it right up their heart. You can see them 
three days later and you can say, what did the preacher teach about on Sunday? I'm not a clue. Well, what happened to him? Where did that go? You go to a movie and I ask you two days later what was the movie about, you can tell me every detail. I've got song lyrics in my head from 50 years ago. What happens? The enemy comes and steals it. If we don't understand how it works. They say, well, I, I know Christians, beloved, and this is not a knock against anybody. I know all kinds of Christians. Oh, I've been going to church all my life. I've been in church 50 years and don't have a clue about the Word of God. Can you imagine somebody going, yeah, I've been going to school for 50 years studying to be a doctor. Don't know even what a band-aid is. <laughs> but the enemy comes in and robs the Word. Takes it away. Matthew chapter 13, you don't, you don't have to turn it if you want, I'm going to go to refer to verse 19. And Matthew 13 is also uh, the same parable. It's, it's recorded and he adds a few words to it. It says the reason that the enemy was able to take that word was because they didn't understand it. Did you ever sit in a class at school and not understand what you were being taught? How many of you ever went to a math class and a week later the teacher says, now we're going to review, can anybody tell me what we studied last week? And you didn't have a clue. How many of you say, went to a math class maybe and walked out in the hallway and somebody said, what did you just study? You said, I don't have a clue. Yeah. Don't have the slightest idea. Why? Because of the next guy who's next sitting next to you who maybe is some kind of math and says, well, I know exactly what we studied here. Get out of the chalkboard. Like, you didn't understand it, and he did. You see, you don't retain something you don't understand very well, do you? And in the Bible, we understand understanding something is revelation. You see, if the Holy Spirit, if you're not tuned in and receiving it from God, then the enemy is going to rob you as soon as you walk out the door. You see, we need to understand that because we need to pursue revelation of God's Word. We need to not allow that to happen in our life. And we need to understand, okay, this is what the pastor teaches. I want to be a fruit-bearing Christian, and he was teaching us about how to bear fruit, and he's teaching us why some people aren't bearing fruit, and I want to understand what the Word of God says about this. I'm going to, if I didn't bash it that first time, I'm going to get into the Word. I'll get a CD. I'll get to watch it on the Internet. I'll do whatever I need. I'll take notes. But I'm going to study that, and I'm going to meditate into that. I'm going to dig into that until that becomes a reality in my life. Beloved, that Word right there is supposed to be a reality in our life. It's supposed to be manifest. It's supposed to bear fruit in our life. What God promises is supposed to be real in our life as believers. But for some reason, something has happened to the body of Christ, and we've settled for going through our religious duties. I attended church. I went there. I heard a sermon preached. It's not real in my life, but I went to church. Who take that branch off the vine. It's not very Yeah, look at me. I know I've been serious these last couple of weeks, but we'll get over it. What, on this world quick, what are the areas that, that I, I'll touch upon? It is it's finances. And, you know, a lot of people grew up, and a lot of us grew up in, in a church culture that really glorify poverty. And you know, we just, oh, I don't care what I have to buy. If all I got something to eat, and I and then that's all I need, and if there's one place to spend it, I would be nice. That's all I need. I'm good enough. Me and God are going to make it through. Do you realize how selfish that attitude is? <coughs> we think it's holy. But it doesn't even line up with God's word. Because God's word tells us we're supposed to preach the gospel. All nations. Who's going to pay for that, Caterpillar? <laughs> so apparently where our financial concerns are, are not just supposed to be, do I have a, a bologna sandwich today? And not only do I have a warm bed, but can, can I give to the Lord for 
for the preaching of the gospel? You realize how much that costs? I mean, you'd be surprised how much money we spend toward that. We send a, a, a little teaching paper out, and, and we're all familiar with that. And, and right now, it goes throughout the United States. It goes to Kenya, South Africa, India, several different churches in those countries. It may not sound like a whole lot, but those churches really depend upon those things. They get those things and use them in their churches for teaching. They teach them in their Sunday school classes. <coughs> you realize how much it costs to send something to Africa? The last time I talked to Caterpillar, they're not willing to pay for that. The Bible tells us we're supposed to give clothing to the needy. The Bible tells us we're supposed to feed the hungry. <coughs> You see, so beloved, God had a place, a plan in place when it dealt with finances, and that was when people give and pay their tithes and offerings, God's going to bless them, and God's going to bless them, and they're going to give, and God's going to bless them, and they're going to give. You see, money, I understand money now. It's just simply a tool for the to preach the gospel with. So I can't just sit and say, well, God, the homes, I've got a holy sandwich and a warm bed, I'm good. Because God tells me to give to preach the gospel. God tells me to give to clothe the naked. God tells me to give to feed the hungry. I'm not hungry. So you see, it's not just about me. It's about what I give. And that's a different way of looking at finances than most of us have grown up looking at it. But that's Bible. That's revelation of God's word. Let me so far. Verses 16 and 17, Mark chapter 4. I'm trying to hurry here. We're losing people. People are falling out on me. We're going to find out here in a minute why you can't fall asleep and bear fruit. Mark chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Verse 17, and have no root in themselves. And so endured but for a time. Afterward, when affliction and persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. They get mad because the word ain't coming true in their life. They get mad because Bob Jones is getting the word of God blessing in his life and not theirs. They get mad because they've been going to church now for, for a month and a half and, and they love Jesus and all these bad things are still happening. They get mad because so-and-so said a certain thing in church and so-and-so acted a certain way and, and, and they were they were just they didn't like the way that preacher preached that day. There's all the big list of why people get offended. Can I share something with you? A great observation after all these years of ministry. Offended people don't bear fruit. Am I thinking on that? Wait a second. Persecution. That word persecution, or affliction, excuse me, the word affliction means just pressure that's put on you. Ever felt like just pressure? That life was just pressure? That it was just pushing on you? I go to church and I'm serving God, but I still feel all this pressure. So maybe it's not what it's supposed to be. I read the Bible and I pray and I, I believe God, but I still feel all this pressure. Drive away. 
means you go to church and you hear the sermon and you go home and you sit down and all these little demons start giving you all these different ideas why you don't need to listen to the preacher and you don't need to go to church, you don't need to do this and you don't need to do that. Anything that drives you away from Jesus. Anything that drives you away from the Word. Anything that drives you away from the things of God. And then the pressure starts getting to them. The pushing away starts getting to them. And the heart starts to harden. If God was who he says he was, this wouldn't happen to me. I mean, my goodness, that preacher got up there and started talking about all those blessings of God and look at the mess I'm in. And then you get mad at the preacher. Oh, trust me, you do. Trust me, you, you get real mad at the preacher about that point. The preacher comes out and says, oh, I don't want to talk to you. Pray with you. Ah! <laughs> okay, praise the Lord. Because <coughs> you're offended. You've taken offense. And the enemy has a wedge in your heart. And the word of God will not bear fruit in your life. Because after all of that takes place, the enemy gets that wedge. He comes in and reaches into your heart. And takes all the word that's been planted there. And rejoices because he's robbed your seed. Verses 18 and 19. We're about, we're about there. Hang on. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, deceitfulness, riches, and lust of other things enter in. Choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Cares of this world. Sometimes when I read these things, it's fun. I have to laugh at myself. Cares of this world means the things that draws you in different directions. I know none of you guys are like me, but sometimes I have a hard time focusing on one thing. <clears throat> because I want to bounce over here and do this, I want to bounce over here and do this, I want to bounce over here and do this, I want to bounce over here and do this. You see, I can watch so many people's lives and I can see how the enemy uses his devices so much. See, because I can see people begin to, to grow in the Word and grow in the things of God. And all of a sudden, they've got distractions. And they don't recognize that something spiritual is happening. They're like, Pastor, I know I, I should have been there in church and I should have been in the Word, but this pulled me over here, this pulled me over here, and this pulled me over here. And I'm thinking, nothing should pull you away from God's Word. You can't allow nothing to pull you away from God's word if you're going to bear fruit. It can't happen. Because you can't bear fruit if you allow that to happen. You can't bear fruit if you allow yourself to get offended. Be like Martha and Mary when Jesus said, Martha, you're comforted about many things. You're troubled about many things. She was bouncing off the walls and Jesus is sitting there teaching. Deceitfulness of riches. It doesn't say riches. It says the deceitfulness of riches. There's a lot of people out there who are deceived by riches. That doesn't mean that riches are the problem. That means that they think that money is going to meet their need. Money will not meet your need. God meets your need. Money is a tool. I just explained to you a second ago the proper use of money is to promote the kingdom of God. It's a tool. It's a tool. I can get people out here who, who are atheists to work for God with money. I can haul an atheist and if I'll pay him enough, he'll come out here and clean the parking lot off for me. It's a tool. That's all it is. But when you get deceived by riches is when you think the riches is going to meet your need. The 
rich or ruler, the one that, that wouldn't give to the poor and come follow Jesus. We know in Mark chapter 10, Jesus made it plain that if he'd have done that, he'd have been abundantly blessed financially. But he couldn't let go of it because he thought that money meant his need. You see, beloved, all these things I'm sharing with you, I know can bring home because I know each and every one of you have been through these battles. I know each and every one of you have been through these things. You see, here's something we've got to understand. Go back to Mark chapter 4. My last key point here, hang with me. Verse 20. And these are they which are so on good ground, such as hear the word, and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundredfold. The ones in verse 20 who brought forth fruit were no different than the ones before except the ground. They faced afflictions. They faced persecutions. They faced cares of this world. They faced the deceitfulness of riches. They faced the lust of other things. They faced all the same battles that the others faced. No matter, when you take a seed and you put it in the ground, all of those seeds fight the same battle, don't they? If it's a drought, it's a drought. If it's too much rain, it's too much rain. If it's too windy, it's too windy. If there's weeds, there's weeds. If there's critters, there's critters. All the battles that seed face, they all face, but some bring forth fruit and some don't. You be honest, some people, all of us as believers, face the same battles. When the word of God gets planted into our heart, we all face the same battles. The difference is some endure and some don't. And if you don't fight through the battles, the seed will not bear fruit in your life. You're like the lady with the issue of blood when she falls in the crowd and touched the hem of his garment. If you don't fight through, if you don't press through, the word of God will not bear fruit in your life. You will have to face afflictions. You will have to face persecutions. You will have to face the cares of this world. You will have to face the deceitfulness of riches. You will have to face the lust of other things. You will be challenged every step of the way. And if you can't walk in and stand strong and endure, it's not going to bear fruit in your life. You think, why in the world, Pastor, does that have to do with John chapter 15 and bearing fruit? I thought you were going to talk about abiding in Jesus. I just did. Go to John chapter 15. Now, depending on what translation you're reading, normally I'm, I'm in the King James here, but I'm going to change it. I'm going to read it twice. And I'm going to show you the Greek word and how we can understand this verse, these verses, I think, in the context of bearing fruit. John chapter 15. Let's begin at verse 1. Reading it out of the King James. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Verse 6, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, they are burned. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Verse 8, here it is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so he shall you be my disciples. Now I'm going to read it differently right now, and more in the context of what I just taught you, and I'm going to read it very specifically in the way that the Greek is very plainly says this. You with me so far? Everybody listen it. I'm about to learn the most important thing I can learn today. I am the true vine, and my father is a husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. I don't want to be that one. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. I want to be that one. Now you are clean to the word which I have spoken unto you. Continue in me, and I in you. 
And the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it continues in the vine. No more can you except you continue in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that continues in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man continues not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you continue in me, and my words continue in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Here it is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. You've got to get this word in your heart. You've got to grab a hold of it. And you've got to persevere no matter what hell throws at you. The same way that the natural seed is planted into the earth. In between the time that seed is planted and that, and that bears fruit, there's all kinds of battles that are designed to destroy that seed. There's all kinds of things that seed must endure. And unless that seed endures and is able to fight through that, it's not going to bear fruit. And the same way in our life, the Word of God is planted into our hearts. And unless it's willing to, we're willing to persevere through the persecutions, persevere through the battles, persevere through the afflictions, persevere through the distractions, persevere through the cares of this world, persevere through the lust of other things, persevere through the deceitfulness of riches, that word is not going to bear fruit. If we don't persevere, if we don't endure, that's why sometimes, beloved, some of you, you know, you'll come to me and, and you'll share something with me, and I fight so hard in your life to stop you from being distracted away from what's happening in your life. I fight so hard to, to, to stop from things pulling you away from what God is doing in your life with His Word. Because I know the devices of the enemy, and I know how subtle they are, and I know how we see my goodness being pulled over here, and being pulled over here, and being pulled over here, and it's just some kind of natural little event, but behind it I see the enemy's handiwork pulling you away from the Word of the living God and stopping the fruit from coming forth.